Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And this year I thought I'd do a special for Halloween. And I, you know, since I live in the state of Florida, I was thinking what is one of the most haunted cities in Florida? Happens to be, as a matter of fact, one of the oldest in the nation, which is St. Augustine. And St. Augustine, which of course uh, predates even the Revolutionary War here in the United States, like all old, old cities or areas, there's a combination of folklore, urban myths, ghost stories, some of them true, some of them made up, some of them embellished. Living only like a three hour ride from St. Augustine, I've been there quite a number of times over the years and it's a beautiful city. I, I hate to say though that lately it's become very touristy. That has some of its charm maybe for one day but you kind of lose the antique feel of it because that's what happens when places become like tourist taps despite having the <clears throat> the St. Marcos Fort and uh, these very narrow cobblestone streets you kind of lose the feel of what St. Augustine is about so I would say that yes if you've never gone there and you're planning to go maybe you can go in the daytime and walk around go to some little restaurants and just check it out but to be perfectly honest with you you best experience St. Augustine at night and like I said during the daytime you get a lot of people walking around traffic and of course all the trendy restaurants and shops and they've got you know the trolley tours and all those things are great if you've never been there but again if you don't go and especially if you you know you're one of these that uh, likes to explore or experience the kind of the ambiance the haunted ambiance that such an ancient city has your best bet is to go at night now I know they have several tours some of them historical some of them ghost tours at night and they're very good some better than others mostly dependent on how knowledgeable are the guides. And again, you can walk it. But apart from that, if you have the time, there's nothing like just walking around without a tour. Maybe you've read up on some of the places and you walk by them and it's just a different feel because even at night when you're on a ghost tour, let's face it, you have to keep up with a group. You have to keep up with a group and sometimes if you find an interesting spot you just can't linger there like you normally would if you were by yourself or let's say with a with your own group in other words at this time of course a lot less people there on the streets no tour buses no automobiles and then is when you start really getting a better full feel of what St. Augustine the true St. Augustine is all about and where a lot of the ghost stories spring from and just to tell you about <clears throat> my own little and I'm not going to say it's a ghost story. I want to say it's an eerie experience. I did exactly that. And, and, and this part is that if you're going to do that, which like I said, is a good idea that you're going to go out there and maybe do like a night stroll that you do some type of uh, prayer of protection. And I'm going to explain to you why. One of the times I decided to do exactly that. And I went to one of St. Augustine's oldest cemeteries uh, called Tolomato Cemetery and for those of you who are seeing the video versus listening on podcast you're going to see on some of the slides one of them one of those slides is me in front of the entrance to Tolomato Cemetery and let me tell you briefly about Tolomato it is one of the oldest sites there in St. Augustine it's on, on, on Cordova Street originally it was a former site of a village of Guala Indians that's why it's named Tolomato and these Indians converted to Christianity and they were converted by the Franciscan monks and what they did was on the side of the village they built a mission this is around 1737 so the village was there they set aside a portion of the village as a cemetery to just about anybody who had converted to Catholicism uh, uh, you know it wasn't only just the the Guala Indians now this location at that time was just outside the city across from the Rosario line which was a defensive line <clears throat> constructed during the first Spanish period 
And the idea is that when you go now to Tolomato Cemetery, you'll see it's right smack in the middle of St. Augustine. But back then, over 200 years ago, it was on the edge. You know, the Spanish, the British, everybody was fighting over portions of the United States as far as well as wars with the natives, you know, the Native Americans that lived in that area. Now, back in 1763, Britain get, gains control of St. Augustine and the, most of the Spanish population, which was a little bit over 3,000, they hightail it for Cuba. A lot of the inhabitants of Tolomato left with them. <clears throat> and what the British did was they burned everything down <laughs> with the exception of, I think there was a Coquina Tower. But in a, in eventually they had some refugees called the Menorcans who were Catholics and they they were given permission by the British and they took over that area and then it continued to be used as a Catholic cemetery by the Menorcans, their descendants and other Catholics in that area and then back in 1783 it came back to Spanish hands and then eventually in 1821 it became it came under American control. The cemetery was not closed till 1884 along with the Huguenot Cemetery which is a little ways there in, uh, outside the city gates of uh, St. Augustine. Of course, you know, no more burials after that. What happened was I I was walking around and, and I said, you know, let, let me go. And I knew the gates, it was closed. The gates are closed, of course. I took some photographs and that was it. And I kept walking. Well, I'll tell you what, after that visit, I started feeling so horribly sick. By the way, I felt perfectly fine. And by this, I mean, you know how sometimes when you're getting sick, you start feeling little, little symptoms that you're, you're not, you're not maybe achy or you get a runny nose or whatever, whatever it is, you start a feeling before you get the full blown, I feel horrible. I went from feeling fantastic, being able to walk around all over the place to feeling absolutely horrible. By the time I got back to my hotel room in the morning, I was I, I, I couldn't even get out of bed. That's how bad I felt. And if you ask me what was wrong, I w wasn't running a fever. I wasn't coughing. I, I just felt overall achy and bad and drained. And it was like I couldn't get out of bed. Needless to say, I ha my original plans were to spend because I had this was I was coming back on the last leg of a trip that I had done to other states and I cut it short I was supposed to spend a couple more days there I think I either went back one or two days early because it was I, I, I need to go home and I just need to lay down and that's it that's exactly what I did I'll tell you what that malaise because that's the only word I can think of of how bad I felt lasted about two months Eventually, I got like a lot of congestion in my chest, which was not how it started out. It took me a full two months to get rid of it, which is very unlike me because like everybody else, yes, I've gotten sick, whether it's a cold or this or that. Yeah, you go through a rough 72 hours and then you get better. And usually by the end of a week, I'm definitely on the mend and that did not happen with this. And when I started thinking back and I realized it was right after that visit to the Tolomato Cemetery. And when you think about it, yes, there was a lot of people buried in Tolomato, which died natural deaths of old age. For example, back in 1801, there was a severe yellow fever epidemic, one of many, because back then, remember, St. Augustine basically sat on the edge, even though it's right there on the coast, there's a lot of swamp behind it. Diseases spread very rapidly, carried by mosquitoes, uh, sometimes like other cities that are like port cities you will have sicknesses brought in by any ship that docks there so in Tolomato all places uh, later on I researched there was a lot of people that were interred even though they did have mass burials when they had these epidemics of people that had died and I'm thinking equivalent to how I felt like I said I went from feeling perfectly perfectly fine energetic to basically not being able to lift my head off my pillow and coming back home early and that's my one eerie experience after visiting Tolomato Cemetery and by this I'm not saying don't go absolutely go but I never I learned my lesson after that I always say a prayer of protection and make sure I don't get any hitchhikers or in some cases by this I don't mean that you're even haunted but a lot of these 
areas carry a lot of the residue as far as what was felt or experienced by a lot of the people that were interred there. And I guess after a point, if you're just even a little bit sensitive, you kind of pick up on it. You take it on. So that's my little story. I mean, I've had other experiences, but let me give you an example of also some of the true things that happened. Like I say, in a lot of places, these are the things that were documented. There's a lot of other stuff that never gets documented. But for example, this was back in November of 1785. 1785, at that time, Florida was not under American rule. It was under the British. United States had become independent less than 10 years before. During that time is what they call the Second Spanish Period. And there was a young army officer by the name of Lieutenant Guillermo Delaney. First, Spanish first name and a, sounds like an Irish last name. But anyway, he is having an affair relationship with a seamstress by the name of Catalina Morain. And she lived with a family by the last name of Gomila. And they lived on a house on Charlotte Street there in St. Augustine. This Gomila, uh, Charlotte Street is just north of Treasury Street. As he's on his way to visit his girlfriend, Catalina, he is set upon by two men that are muffled and they've got on hooded cloaks and they stab him and start to beat him. He manages to get over to the doorway of that Gomila house. He collapses. At this point, the governor of St. Augustine is last name of Cespedes. He starts looking into what happened here because remember, this was a lieutenant of the army that was stationed there. Now it turns out when he starts investigating that apparently Lieutenant Delaney was not the only person that was involved with Catalina. She also had two other soldiers who were her admirers. They worked at the artillery detachment stationed at the Castillo de San Marco at the fort. One was a Sergeant Juan Civelli. All right, he was already in trouble with his superiors because he was known for what they considered scandalous conduct with a servant girl. The other soldier was named Francisco Moraga. Part of the investigation by the governor, he interviews about 30 townspeople, some of them which had heard the struggle, but nobody would come forward and give an absolute time. Part of it is this was very, very early on in the history of of St. Augustine, they didn't have any church towers or anything which struck the hour. Sometimes we think about people not wanting to get involved. In those times, that also held true. Nobody went outside. It was like, close the door, keep it locked. Something's going on. Lieutenant Delaney, he doesn't die right away. He gets treated for his wounds. But of course, because these men were disguised, he couldn't identify them. Apparently, remember, this was at night <clears throat> and a lot of the uniforms and things that were worn by the soldiers were standard gear. In other words, there were hundreds of men at that garrison who were dressed or used the same type of clothing. But then they speak to one of the most important witnesses, which is Catalina, and she implicates two soldiers by the name of Pablo de Matos and Ramon Cucarela, and they're jailed. So the investigation is lagging, but New Year rolls around and Lieutenant Delaney dies. So now all of a sudden, we're going from attempted murder or an attack or robbery or for whatever reason to an actual murder investigation. At that time, the governor was the first and last word as far as Spanish law was concerned. So he applies to Havana, Cuba for help, but they don't send anybody there to basically instruct them how, how does Spanish law handle these situations. He basically thinks, okay, I'm going to have to handle this on my own. And along the way, of course, new facts develop. And it comes out that on the night that Lieutenant Delaney's attacked, Corporal Moraga had been at the St. Francis Barracks and he had been rehearsing for a play. And on his way home, he would go directly past the spot where the lieutenant had been attacked. And also it's noted that Delaney, in other words, had a falling out with Moraga over Catalina. And also seen that Moraga and Sergeant Civelli were also rivals. Again, those two had originally been good friends but it's almost like they decide to get together or collude in order to get rid of the third man, which was Lieutenant Delaney. Now, Corporal Moraga, he denied ever having even gone to the Gomilla house on the night when the lieutenant was attacked. Uh, however, it comes out that he had been there earlier in the evening and that he was also armed, that he had sharpened a quill pen for Senora Gomilla with his cutlass, which is how they know he was armed. Uh, they also had sentries who had been sleeping came into the picture again 
whether they were really sleeping or not, or they were covering for their own, they could not testify and say when the corporal had come to his quarters that night. Eventually, what happened, though, was the investigating soldiers or the officers decided that both Moraga and Catalina Moran were at the very least of perjury and implicating two innocent men, so they were put in jail. 176 pages of testimony from 55 witnesses was sent to Spain's Viceroy in Mexico City. What happens next? Not too clear. The Viceroy died in an epidemic, a fever epidemic. From there, the testimony went off to Spain, where its review was delayed by the death of the minister in charge. And meanwhile, in St. Augustine, the men who had done the investigating or had given testimony were being rotated back to Spain or to other posts in Spanish America. What happened to Corporal Moraga and Canalina Morain? Well, while all of this was going on, they languished in prison until the end of Governor Cespedes' regime in July of 1790. And the final disposition of the case, and whether they were guilty or innocent, was lost in the archives of that period, and it's not known what became of them. The point of this story is, which by the way is true, is that this is the fodder for true ghost stories. And just like these, there were plenty of other things where maybe justice was not timely or never served at all. With over 400 years of trauma, tragedy, heartbreak, war, death, this city is very well known for its ghostly encounters. But exactly where have they taken place? The first one that we're going to look at is an old mansion, originally known as the Abbott Mansion, and it's located on the intersection of Joyner and Abbott Streets. Now, the origins of the haunting of this story goes back to the 19th century when a woman by the name of Lucy Abbott lived there with her lover, which was a Civil War colonel. One day, the colonel disappears, never returns. It's inferred that maybe he abandoned her. Lucy becomes a very angry woman, lives the rest of her life alone in that house and she lived well into her 90s and ultimately she died in a nursing home but like many hauntings she returned back to the house where she had spent so many years of her life which sounds like she had become a very bitter woman during those years reported sightings of ghostly encounters were immediately reported by tenants that over the years would just move out of the house in the 1960s, a couple named David and Star Gray rented an apartment on the second floor. One of the first phenomena that they described was consistently hearing knocks at the door and footsteps in the hallway. And when they would open the door, nobody would be there. Star suddenly described feeling chills and also a voice in a very harsh whisper ordering her to get out, get out. And then over time, they started to see a pale white form that would be standing in the shadows of their living room. Their bed would start to shake in the middle of the night. Obviously, this was a very violent haunting. The moment came when they decided to move out, and this was after Star was thrown down the stairs. That was the proverbial straw on the camel's back when they decided that they had to leave. But even as they were packing their belongings and putting it in the car, Star again had another encounter in which... She described with that same force tried to throw her out the second story window of the mansion. No doubt they were very happy once they had actually left the premises. Uh, eventually it was bought over by a lady by the name of Vera Kramer. She was a 92 year old and she lived in it for 36 years. According to her, she had not had any ghostly experiences. The only thing she ever described was that she had a small chihuahua who would scurry into the corners of her breakfast room and kitchen, point its head up the wall, and bark at absolutely nothing, as in thin air. But that's about it. Compared to the description of the other tenants, nothing happened. But then again, that's what she says. Now, the next story is about a building that during the 1990s was a seafood grill. But the origins of the building itself go back hundreds of years. This building sits, well, it's a house, sits on Avenida Menendez. The existing records take it back to 1800, but the original house was built around 1745 when a lady by the name of Juana Navarro, who was a St. Augustine native, she marries Francisco de Porras, and together they have nine children. 
One of their children is a daughter by the name of Catalina, who was born in 1753. And the family lives in the house, which back then was Bay Street, until about 1763. And when the city of St. Augustine goes back to the British, they sail for Havana and they never return except for Catalina. She comes back to the house, which she had moved away from uh, when she was 10 years old. By this time, she's married a, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Ponce de Leon in Cuba. She returns to St. Augustine because Spain's regained possession of it, and she comes to reclaim her house. When she gets there, she finds out that even though it had been unoccupied, eventually, during the time that Britain had it, they had seized it as a property and they were using it as a storage shed. Eventually, when they petitioned to the governor, they recovered the house, but that was not till like 1789. By then, she's 36 years old and she dies only six years later, so she wasn't able to enjoy the childhood home for very long. In 1887, a huge fire sweeps through much of St. Augustine, destroying a lot of buildings, including that dwelling. But luckily, a few years before that, it had been sketched and they rebuilt it in 1888 on the original foundations. But this time it's with concrete instead of tabby, which was very commonly used back during the 16th century for building in that area. Various people obviously lived throughout the years in the new building up until 1976 when it became the Puerta Verde restaurant which translates in Spanish to the Green Door restaurant and then after that it became Chart House, Catalina's and then in the 1990s it was named Harry's which was the seafood restaurant grill and it was owned by a gentleman by the name of Rick. Back during the times that it was known as the Chart House, Rick the owner had contracted with a local family to clean it every night obviously between the closing and the opening of the next day and on more than one occasion while they would be cleaning the ladies restroom on the second floor one of the families would see a woman dressed in a long white dress almost like a wedding dress when she would look at her the woman would instantly disappear and one of the times she even saw this lady walk right through one of the restroom doors Another time, Rick had one of his employees run up to him and tell him that there was a fire in the back room because they would wash their own uh, tablecloths and napkins, etc. He runs back thinking he might have a short circuit or something's gone wrong with a washer and a dryer. Comes up to a basket full of clean tablecloths and napkins and finds that they're smoldering, but he can't account for what would have caused that nobody was smoking the thing was combustible and that was one of the mysteries as far as that were attributed eventually to the ghost that you know wandered throughout this establishment now there were others that had experiences there was another gentleman he was cleaning up during the day and he comes up to rick and says uh, something along the lines of you're going to think i'm crazy but on the second floor near the ladies room i've been smelling this woman's perfume that is so strong that it stinks apparently this was not the first time that rick had heard this because other other cleaning personnel and other employees for years had been telling him the same thing so he wasn't surprised when he had a guy come up and tell him which in a way lends validation when you have all these different people coming and describing the same phenomena now on another time brick he's planning to do an inventory which he would do very early in the morning before the restaurant was open around five in the morning one of the ladies uh, who was still cleaning she's sitting in the lounge and she's have taking a little break having some coffee and the muffin and then she hears the patio door opening and she's thinking that rick is coming in so she calls out to him and no one answers her so she gets up goes to the room to see who's in the patio and then she sees that the door is jiggling and then she sees the lady in the white dress and this lady's looking back at her and then she sees this lady passes through the closed door and disappears and in truth he didn't rick didn't arrive there till almost six o'clock she thought that it was him because she was expecting him for inventory but he did not arrive there till almost an hour after that the activity just hasn't been or described in the first and the second floor of the building the owner has his office on the third floor and at one time he had one of the waitresses who was uh, working part-time because she was going to school and she, sometimes she would stay late to use the copier and the computer to do her schoolwork so one evening this was right after you guessed it inventory he's at his desk uh, working on his calculator and he sees out of the corner of his eye a flash of white 
pass behind them heading in the direction of the copier so he's thinking that it's this waitress that would normally uh, sometimes use the copier after hours so he calls out to her calls out to her again and still he doesn't get no answer so he's thinking what's going on he gets up from its desk and goes back to the copier nobody's there so he goes down to the second and then the first floor and finds out there's no one in the building at all checks all the locks and after that he says he just left without even bothering to go back up to the third floor there's been other occasions when lights have come on after everyone has left this is after the close-up crew in other words the owners all the the last people that are left there in the restaurant have cleaned up and everybody exits the building all together for example one of the times one of the employees she's locking the door and she notices that some of the lights are still on and she realizes or she knows that everything had already been turned off now she's there with another waiter she asked them and of course everybody's saying that none of them have re-entered the restaurant into any of the rooms to turn them on they even had instances where candles have been lit after everyone has left so which makes sense especially if we're talking a ghost from a time when the mode of lighting would be a candle versus electricity now the majority of the activity centers around obviously the ladies room on the second floor another time some visitors who were coming to the restaurant for lunch they asked the waiter about the ghost of the ladies bathroom the, apparently they had heard stories and he tells them to come back in the evening because this is when she's more active two of them come back they make a couple of trips into the bathroom but they find nothing he tells them teasing that they should go in there and hold a seance he i guess he doesn't think that they're going to take him up on his word when he comes back to finish with their order he finds that they're on the balcony and they're totally shaken up and one of them has a red outline of a hand on her upper arm where the story goes that Catalina had slapped her as she was leaving the ladies room because apparently Catalina was not in a very good mood because as you can see Catalina is the usual suspect as to who the ghost is but in truth I don't think they could be very sure many of the stories don't describe her as being that physical another story is that a stack of small tissues that sits on the counter in the ladies room they would have one of the witch every once in a while go in there just to make sure that there was enough tissues and you know in other words replenish it she one time describes how she goes in there at about four o'clock and the tissues are all over the place all over the counter she doesn't think anything about it she just thinks some customers are messy so she puts them back in a pile straightens everything out two hours later she comes back to check and again the tissues are scattered all over the place and that happened to two or two more times it's to the point that she realized that it wasn't messy customers now at one point the restaurant did have the name of Catalina's at that time there was another employee who saw her many times uh, upstairs there's a waiter station and it had a mirror and he described often seeing an image of a woman in white dress out of the corner of his eye but when he would look straight at her she would disappear very similar to what other people would describe later on uh, during the 1990s he saw her a lot of times going down the hallway on the second floor also they would hear something after hours when it was very quiet he said mostly what he would do is he would get the chills but uh, he not actually never left the building screaming and he described where he would see this lady in white at least once or twice a week and one of the things was which is very telling a lot of people that see apparitions is that they never see the face in other words that they they see her out of the corner of their eye when she's walking away but they never get to see the actual face of the person Catalina is supposedly not the only ghost in that house other people have reported seeing a man dressed in an old-fashioned black suit uh, described as being from around the turn of the 19th century another time a customer asked the waitress who the man was in the funny black suit that was on the other side of the room and the waitress looks and there's nobody there same thing he this gentleman in the black suit many times seen close to the wine case and one of the waitresses one time saw him coming down the stairs actually followed him you know with her eyes as he walked towards the wine case and then she followed him and when she went around the corner to where the case was at nobody there except the wine case stories from the past mention that there had been an unidentified man who died in that fire of 1887 now it turns out that in 1887 there was not one but two fires in st augustine 
The first one occurred on April the 12th, 1887. It started about 3 a.m. in the boiler room of the St. Augustine Hotel. From there, it went through the main building. It went through several buildings that were adjacent. And at that time, there was only one person that had died, which was a female employee at the hotel by the name of Bridget Murphy. However, this was not the only fire. Only four days later, on April 16th, at about 2 a.m., another fire breaks out and it destroys in total nine buildings uh, that were between Orange Street, Talamato, St. George, and the city gates. They don't describe where they were at that time of anybody that lost their lives. However, they find that there was an arson. In other words, it was an arsonist. And at that time, they described that a stranger had been arrested and placed in jail charged with a crime as to whether he was culpable of the first one it's unknown however this leads up to what is supposed to be one of the other phantoms that was haunting this location that used to be the the house and then the seafood restaurant fast forward up to 1993 there's a girl she's researching her family tree and she contacts Rick who during the 1990s is the owner of the restaurant. She tells him that her great-grandfather had lived in that house sometime around the turn of the century of the 1900 when the building was empty and it was in probate and the family who owned it had sent them from Ohio to live in it. Now her great-grandfather apparently was in poor health. His doctor thought that the Florida climate would be good for him. So there's chances he might have even had tuberculosis. Now he dies in the house around midnight, short time after arriving there. So whoever the ghost is, his presence has been seen many times in the restaurant. However, never at the same time as Catalina's ghost. Again, that raises the question, is this the unidentified man that died during the 1887 fire? Is it the man who died shortly after arriving from Ohio unknown now many psychics and uh, paranormal investigators have risked they've visited the location they've documented a lot of activity supposedly won't even photograph the ghost standing at the second floor window one of the times that they were holding a festival there in St. Augustine a group of uh, people had come in for dinner one of the ladies in the group identified herself as a psychic and asks uh, there's a ghost in this place isn't there and the manager says yes and she goes on to say well I can tell you about her and she goes on to describe that the place there with the, the room with the fireplace was this phantom's bedroom and she was very restless because she had had a problem with a man and of something that had happened to her life could this be Catalina as it dovetails with her sad story we really don't know or was it another person back in uh, 1993 was when they changed the name of the restaurant to Catalina's Garden and I guess this was they were taking this as an opportunity to try to make the ghost happier and for a time there was less activity but shortly thereafter it picked up again back in uh, 2004 one of the employees goes up to to where they keep the linen and again he sees the lady in the white dress he rushes down to tell another waiter about what he's seen because i imagine by now if you hadn't seen the lady and what you had heard about her from the other employees the other waiter thinks that he's joking doesn't believe him they both go back up there he sees the white lady as well there's a lot of people that if they don't exactly see her they feel the presence around the area of the ladies room on the second floor as a matter of fact one of the lady servers she had gone in there just you know to use the restroom when she was over the basin she, she somebody pushed her into the sink as you know she was uh, straightening out her uniform and her hair there's been more than one employee who has described the exact same experience there was even one girl she was she was new she describes where she sees a glass just fly off a table another time she was rolling silverware into napkins right before the restaurant opens and she hears footsteps coming up the t stairs she turns around sees no one goes back to her work again hears the footsteps this time when she turns around she sees a shadow go by real quick and then an, another one of the hostesses who's talking to a customer both of them see a plant move some people actually see her sometimes people hear steps other people feel chill other people have the whole range and like in a lot of these places usually the people that spend the most time there such as employees and like all these places after a while it seems really interesting and a lot of people take it in stride because not only do they have customers that come back for the food but they're hoping 
that they're going to run into Catalina, if indeed that's who the ghost is. Now, the next story has to do with the city gates, which part of it, the, en the entry portion still exists to this day if you go there. The timing on this leads one to believe that this possibly could be an urban myth or a true story that somehow got mixed up as what as far as the timing or actual location but the story goes this way it's uh, at the north end of St. George Street the Coquina made city gates are about three stories high this is the area where they got all the shops and all the restaurants there supposedly in this area is a sighting of a young girl named Elizabeth who she's seen hanging around the gates late at night. The story goes that Elizabeth was supposedly the daughter of a gatekeeper in the early 1800s and she would come out and visit her father during the times where I guess he would be at the city gates around dawn and closing them at dusk. However, she supposedly died when she was nine years old of typhoid fever. Remember I mentioned that there were several times that different types of fevers swept through the city. However, after this, several people have reported seeing her. There's a candy shop that is directly across from the city gates and one of the owners describes where she consistently hears a child's voice, door opening and closing, turns around, nobody's there. Other times she's described where she's had toys and candies rearranged like overnight when she comes in. The thing is this, that when you look into this is accurate, it turns out that during this time, there was no such thing as a gatekeeper. The time period is wrong. As described in the first story, the only thing they had earlier was that they would have a soldier on rotation and he would be assigned to do sentry there. Was there some story that maybe it was a soldier way back earlier than what they say who had a daughter, who had a little daughter that would come and stay with him? Who knows? But either way, that's a pretty good ghost story. The next story is about a haunted building that's on the corner of Hippolyta Street. Most of the buildings in this area of St. Augustine has gone through different incarnations. Back in the 1990s, it was a bar, it was closed up, and this happened right before that. And uh, it, it was a two-story uh, structure built during the British period. In the rear, there was a small courtyard with a patio, wooden decks shaded by trees. And you'll see there's a lot of buildings in St. Augustine that have that little courtyard built into either the front or the back of the building. Up in the second story of that building, uh, they used to have uh, living quarters. What, what they had done was the owners of the bar had turned it into a small apartment. They would rent out for a little bit of extra income. They could actually do it because since this was such an old building, and of course the walls were so thick, that even though it was situated over a bar, you would not get all the noise and music floating up there and it was a really nice little apartment. Uh, it had the, a balcony that ran the entire length of the building. It looked out over the courtyard in the back. It was a nice little place for somebody to, you know, rent it out. And it had a stairway, a private entrance that led from the street up to the balcony. From there, there was a doorway into the house. And this is exactly who rented it back then. Two girls, both have been roommates in college. One of them is a St. Augustine native. Both of them get a job very close to there. Both decide, yeah, you know, besides being roommates in college, we're gonna be roommates here. They both move into this little apartment, which happened to be within walking distance of both of their jobs. They fall in love with it. It has two bedrooms, a large living room, a bath, tiny kitchen, but let's face it. When you're young and fresh out of college, this is, the perfect apartment for you. At the beginning, everything is wonderful. It's small. They have no problem whatsoever living over a bar. They settle in. They just have what's called a carefree lifestyle. And by this, I'm pointing out that these girls didn't move into this apartment expecting or looking to encounter anything in the supernatural. On the contrary, they're just having a good time, being young, being carefree. What happens is that one day in August, it's hot. Uh, it's towards the evening. They're hanging out on the balcony. Saturday night. And neither one of them had to get up early the next morning. And then about midnight, one of them gets up. She says, good night. Yeah, I'm, I'm going in to, to bed. The other, the other girl stays out in the balcony. A few minutes later, the one that stays out in the balcony decides, oh, you know what? I'm going to sleep myself. She goes all the way to the other end of the balcony just to make sure that the door is locked. Because remember, this door leads up from a staircase that is how you would get into the apartment. She flicks on a light uh, when she gets to the screen door. She looks down the stairs. 
doesn't see anybody, but all of a sudden she starts smelling something really unusual. And what it is, is a very heavy smell of garlic and human sweat, but she can't see anybody. And she described it like a man who hadn't showered in several days and had eaten a lot of Italian food or something, of course, with a lot of garlic in it. She can't make head or tails of it. Then what she does is she just turns off the light and goes inside. Next morning, she's totally forgotten about the incident. But that same evening, both girls are again, they're sitting on the balcony and they're eating a spaghetti and salad. That same roommate again notices the exact strange smell. Turns to her friend and says, do you smell that? The other one shakes her hand and goes, smell what? That smell, the garlic and sweat smell. The other girl's like, ah, I don't smell anything. She goes on to describe the smell and tells her, hey, last night, this is what happened to me. I smelled the exact same thing. The girl says, oh, you know, you're spending too much time in the sun, dismisses it, you could laugh about it. But again, remember, all at this point, the only thing that's happening is just one of them seems to be smelling somebody uh, that hasn't taken a shower and eats a lot of garlic. Three weeks go by, nothing happens, and one evening, that roommate, the one that had smelled everything, here she is again on the balcony by herself, and she's looking down the street, and she hears footsteps. Turns around, doesn't see anybody, but then she looks closer, and she thinks she sees somebody. She gets scared, and she runs inside and tells the other roommate, hey, I think there's somebody up on the balcony. Both of them get very alarmed because of course they realized somebody had come up the stairs and was up on the balcony so they go outside there's nobody there they check the door at the top of the stairs and it's locked so they go back inside and then both of them smell the sweat and garlics again nothing happens for several weeks all of a sudden one of the girls she returns to the apartment right after dark the other roommate wasn't home yet she girl she unlocks the screen door at the top of the stairs walks down to the balcony and then to the front door. She's unlocking it, you guessed it. She smells that garlic and sweat, turns around and looks back down the balcony. And then she sees him. She sees a small man, probably not taller than her. And as she looking at him, she realizes he's wearing really strange looking clothing, light colored, knee length pants, a dark tunic like coat and some sort of belt or a sash around the shoulders and that he's got a heavy belt and he's got also a sword around his waist and he's got a tall brimless hat she can't really make out anymore because the lighting is very dim truth be told she didn't stand there trying to figure it out she screams runs into the apartment locks the door turns on all the lights and calls the police. He was solid enough that she actually thought, despite his strange clothing, that he was an intruder. The other roommate arrives, the police are there, the bar owner's there, they had to calm the other girl down. The police go through the apartment, they check for anybody that tried to force their way in, can't find anything or anybody. They leave. The girl that had seen the ghost, she's like, I'm not staying here another night. Not in this apartment. The one girl that was the one that's left behind is the one that was a St. Augustine native. Tells her, hey, okay, you know what? I'll take you to my mom's house and you can spend the night there. The next day, roommate comes back, packs her things, and leaves for good. So we've got the one girl left. She was kind of upset at first, but see, she kind of realizes since she'd lived there all her life that what she was dealing with was a ghost. She decides, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give up on this great apartment. A few days after the roommate departs, nothing happens. After a while, she starts realizing, you know what? description because remember she hadn't seen him yet the description of what her roommate had told her about sounded like it was a spanish soldier doesn't see anything but about a week later she sees him same clothes that her roommate had described the tall hat that she said reminded her of a bishop smiter the front peak and the rear peak she also sees that he's carrying not only a sword but a rifle instead of running away and screaming she just stands there and looks at him and then he just melts into the darkness next night he comes back she sees him now on the other side of the window looking into the apartment. Two or three days pass, doesn't see him. Then he comes again and his visits start to become more and more regular to the point where she's like seeing him almost every night in one of two ways. She either sees him on the balcony or she sees him on the balcony. In other words, looking through the window into the apartment from the balcony. He's always never smiling. And now what happens is that the word has gotten around St. Augustine about this ghost and she cannot find anybody who's willing to be the roommate because everybody's heard about 
the ghost of the century. It gets to the point where even she's unnerved because it's so regularly that he appears and she realizes that she's finding more and more excuses to stay and sleep over at her parents' house. She realizes, I can't stay here and she moves out. And at this point, nobody really knows. Is that Spanish soldier still there guarding that little rundown apartment? Chances are, possibly, because it seems he'd been there already a long time to begin with. To uh, bring in more recent discovery of St. Augustine, and just, just to give you an idea how easily you could encounter a ghost or a chilly feeling or an eerie experience, what might look like a very normal location. The story I'm going to retell, this was something that was discovered a little bit over a year ago. It was in uh, 2017. During the time that Hurricane Matthew, that it you know went through Florida, it damaged a, a wine shop on St. Augustine's Plaza. Now the owner, uh, he, take, he makes a decision to renovate the space. What happened was that the floor of this building was built on a joist system back in 1888 and that left the soil underneath that system or the flooring relatively intact. So what the owner does is he contacts the city archaeologist and tells him, do you want to take a look before I start the repairs? Archaeologist says okay but doesn't think he's really going to find anything. Turns out he's absolutely wrong. Right after pulling out a few shovelfuls of dirt, they come across human remains. Of course, now they dig more carefully and they discover an intact adult skeleton and adult skull. They preliminarily identify them as young white European, a young white European woman and a man of African ancestry. Outside of the shop, which is a wine shop, they find a leg bone and another skull from two other graves. A little bit later on, they come across the remains of children. It sometimes, unfortunately, was not that uncommon because during this time period, children died very easily. The, all the human remains were found in a six by 12 foot area. They also found pottery with the skeletons that dated the burials like between 1572 to 1586, which is a few years right after St. Augustine was founded. And they also believe that there's going to be other remains in the area. At that point, the archaeologist believes that these burials came from the floor of a church known as Nuestra Señora de los Remedios. This was a parish church built in St. Augustine soon after the colony was established by the conquistador Pedro Menéndez de Avilas in 1565, 42 years before the Jamestown colony was established in, uh, by the English and about 55 years before the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts. What happens is this church is burned down in a raid uh, by the British privateer Sir Francis Drake in 1586. They rebuild the church and then in 1599 a hurricane comes through, destroys it for good and they rebuild it and then 1702 the British torch it. Of course we're talking here over a 300 year period so the exact location of the church was not discovered until 2010. Very similar scenario, they're doing construction on Avila Street, which is part of the city's historic downtown. They discover a trench in a wall that was the rear of the church. During that time, back in 2010, they dig, they uncover some human bones, which the archaeologists believe were probably the bodies of priests. And they think that the footprint of the church extended all the way to the present day where the wine shop was at and that more than likely the bodies they discovered had been originally buried under the church floor which was a standard practice for Catholics at that time. <clears throat> During that time the mission churches through Florida would everybody would bury everybody in the church floor uh, because it was considered consecrated ground. The skeletons that were found in the wine shop, they decided that they're going to leave them there. And what they did was with the bones that were found outside, they're going to be moved and buried in a nearby Catholic cemetery. Follow up, a very interesting follow up to the story, I found where there was a blog entry by a gentleman that claimed that him and his wife had owned this wine shop prior to the present owners. They had it for seven years. He claims that during the time that they were there, the amount of paranormal activity was amazing. Uh, he claims that he had a security camera, a very good security camera, that recorded uh, unbelievable amounts of strange activity. Everything stepped up when they were getting ready to move up. And at that time, he had no idea whatsoever that there were these bodies buried underneath the location of the wine shop, that it was part of what originally was 
a Catholic church. The point being that when you walk around St. Augustine, yes, you might go to some historic sites or others that already have a reputation for being haunted, but same thing, you could be walking or standing anywhere there that by looking at it presently, you would have no idea that at one point it might have been a cemetery, it might have been a church, or some other structure stood there, and that you might have a ghostly encounter just because of what was once there at one time. Now this next story is again about a building that's located on St. George Street. Uh, during the 1940s, it was a tailor's shop, a clothier shop, a men's clothier shop, and it was owned by a gentleman by the name of Frank Kixmiller, known as Kixie Kixmiller, who served two terms as mayor for St. Augustine. And he had this clothier shop and he had a gentleman by the name of Kenny Beeson who worked there as a tailor. Now this tailor shop was set up like uh, many shops of this type where the front was a storefront open for customers and in the back they had a, a workroom and this is where Kenny would spend a lot of his time if he was not attending to customers in the front. And as the story goes, one evening he's working late, he's by himself in the shop and he is sitting at one of the sewing machines and he's just caught up in working on a on some pants when all of a sudden he hears the doorknob turning he looks up and he watches as the knob of the storeroom starts to turn and then the door opens very slowly and he's sitting there not knowing what to think and then he all of a sudden described that an overpowering smell of flowers like something you would smell at a funeral home envelops him it's almost sickeningly sweet like very cheap perfume and the smell clings to him it doesn't go away so he closes the shop goes home however even when he gets home he's still smelling the same scent overpowering scent of the flowers however his wife doesn't smell anything at all days roll into weeks into months all of a sudden all these strange things start to happen more and more regularly and at first he's very scared but after a point he starts becoming used to what he calls his visitors even though he considers it a little bit unnerving because he realizes that nothing really bad happens to him one of the experiences he commonly had was that the door leading to the storeroom and the bathroom would open and close items that were in the workroom would move them from one place to another and of course he still has uh, that smell of the funeral flowers every once in a while just parade the entire area sometimes not all the time they would happen at night there would be other times where it would happen in the middle of the day same thing with uh, whether it's the opening of the doors or that sweet aroma and what's surprising is when he experiences it especially in the middle of the day when other people are around he realizes that he is the only one that smells it None of the seamstresses, nobody else, none of the employees or customers ever smell it. One evening, late one evening, every, again, everything is quiet in the shop. He hears what sounds like soldiers or sailors marching on a wooden floor, perhaps a deck. And it's a very rhythmic, like marching. Uh, and he describes it as leather heels and like if they're on a regular marching type, not just regular walking. Now, later on, the owner of the shop, Kixie Kixmiller, and others, they also start hearing this sound out on the street when nobody's around. And of course, at that time, nothing in the area has any type of foot flooring, neither in the tailor shop or any of the surrounding shops. As a matter of fact, nothing in that section of the street. However, they can hear the sound of men marching on wooden planks. And this goes on for several years where on and off, several different people that would work in that area, had shops in that area, would hear the same sound. Years go by, Kenny's still working there as a tailor, and they install a television in the workroom. And one day again, he's working late, and a friend drops by and keep him company. They're watching television, and all of a sudden, he Kenny's working on, on a collar for a coat, some work that he, you have to do by hand. And uh, while he's doing this, he's talking to his friend. All of a sudden, the storeroom door knob turns, and the door opens. And again, really sickening, sweet smell of funeral flowers comes into the room. And Kenny, of course, has witnessed and smelled this many times before. This is the first time that someone else besides Kenny smells this very strange scent. Now, they're both sitting there, and then the bathroom door suddenly swings open. At that point, Kenny's friend says, you know what, I'm going to leave. I'm getting ready to leave. 
But what Kenny decides to do this one time is he gets out a small tape recorder that he recently got, pops in a blank tape. This is around the time of cassettes. Presses the record button and just leaves it lying on the table. Because when his friend says, I'm leaving, he's like, yeah, I'm leaving with you. So they both leave, lock up the place, make sure both doors to the storeroom and the bathroom are closed and all the lights are out. Next day, he comes back and he starts listening to the tape. Just as he expects, he hears the door to the bathroom and the storeroom opening and closing. However, nothing nothing has been disturbed there. Rewinds the tape, turns it on. He hears the sounds of when he's leaving with his friend from the previous night. Uh, as, and as a matter of fact, he even hears the sound of their cars starting up and driving away. Then he gets silence. But then within a few seconds, he hears the stomping of feet. And then it's followed by a very strange, unearthly guttural sound. Something that made his spine tingle just listening to it. And he hears doors opening and closing. The sound of the heels marching back and forth. Something squeaking, possibly a mouse or a rat. And then something else like possibly a dog scratching at a door trying to get in somewhere in the background on top of all of this he starts hearing what are he thinks of as unnatural or unintelligible guttural sounds and he can't make head or tails because this is mixed in in the background of all the other noises another thing that's recorded is that they would have an old ship spell in the front of the store which would indicate when a customer had arrived well he hears this ship's bell go off of course at that time the shop is closed so kenny calls in kixie who's the owner and also this friend of his was there and they listen to the tape and they all hear the same thing and as a matter of fact kenny's friend dies not long after that from a heart attack the store would be open late on thursdays and fridays the owner would leave early and during the time that kenny was left alone uh, in the in the workroom they install a buzzer they had it hooked up for many years and it, it had basically it ran from a wire uh, in the front door through a drop ceiling and back to the workroom this worked without a problem for many years and the story goes back in the early 1970s customer enters buzzer doesn't work when kenny starts checking the system he finds that the wires have been cut up above in the drop ceiling and he knows perfectly well that nobody had any reason for going up there and much less to cut up the wiring. So what finally happens is that Kenny, after many years of having all these experiences on and off, has had enough and he calls on Monsignor Jordan who is down the street at the cathedral and he wants him to come right over and perform a rite of exorcism. The Monsignor, like a lot of stories that you've heard uh, when they're asked to do this, was very reluctant, tries to pass it off to a priest in Miami, tells Kenny, you know what, uh, I'll get this priest, but Kenny's having none of that, tells him, no, I'm not gonna wait for a priest to come all the way from Miami. I want you to come over right now. So Monsignor comes over that same evening with his crucifix and holy water he performs the rite, walks around the entire store, in the back, inside and out, goes through all the rooms, the storerooms, the bathroom, blesses everything. During the ceremony, he tells any unwanted spirits that they need to depart. The strange happenings after that, they do stop. Everything except the smell of the funeral flowers. For years afterwards, even when Kenny was no longer working there and he would go down the street to get some coffee and pass by the store, he would still smell that sickeningly sweet aroma of the flowers. And uh, Kenny uh, passed away in 1981. However, there's more to this story than just what happened or stopped happening after the rites of exorcism. As you know, that, that area, there's other shops. Once the rite of exorcism was performed at that location, everything calmed down. But down the street, there's another place called the Lipinski Building. Had stores at the ground level and got a lot of other places. There was a second floor, sometimes used as apartments. The owners of a restaurant that were just south of the plaza on Avila Street lived in one of the apartments upstairs at uh, at that location. This was back in uh, during the 80s and the 90s. There was a nun who was a sister of St. Joseph and she used to walk past a restaurant on Avila's. She became friendly with the owners got to know each other very well. So one day, this sister had been given as a gift a bright red blouse, which of course she couldn't use. So she gives it to the owners of the restaurant. The owner of the restaurant, lady, uh, you know, the wife of the, 
the couple in other words that owned it they accept the gift but she doesn't really like the blouse doesn't like the color red but accepts it and what she does is she goes home and puts it in the back of her closet not long this is around the same time that Kenny's having his experiences in the tailor shop so not long after the exorcism at the tailor shop this couple they come home to their apartment at the Lipinski building this is after they had closed down the restaurant for the day and they find this red blouse laid out on the bed the wife looks at her husband and asks well, why did you get this blouse out you know I'm not gonna wear it looks at her and says I didn't get it out I just came in with you and they both laugh and I guess they just leave it at that however over the next few months every time they come home they find the same blouse laid out on the bed and of course they were within each other's company so they can't accuse one or the other of putting that blouse out so one evening they come home and they find a book on the bed and the wife says didn't we both finish reading this a couple of months ago and they both agree they had and of course she's asking well why did you get it out he turns around and tells her i didn't even know we had put it so much less I didn't know where to find it or put it there very shortly after the incident with the book there's a couple that's in the next apartment invites them over for coffee you know they're having a conversation and the woman that lives next door to them starts telling them how she and her husband are both waking up together at 11 o'clock and then again at 2 30 in the morning and this has been happening to them for the last several days they can't figure out any reason why they're both waking up at the same time nothing there's no disturbance there's no noise they even look out on the street but they never see anything the owners of the restaurant while they're hearing this story they look at each other because they realize the same thing's been happening to them and then the neighbors drop their bomb because they turn around and they tell them oh by the way you know we have a ghost and it's a man and the lady says i know it's a man because he's very fresh he keeps slapping me on the behind the couple laugh it off however when they get home they start having a very serious conversation about the red blouse the book waking up twice every night they think okay we need to figure out is this something supernatural what's going on here they start looking around for somebody who's going to help them out and eventually they get connected with a psychic comes to the apartment walks around the whole place stops in each room and finally goes to the stairwell and in the stairwell she says this is where I feel the strong presence of your guest and his name is Henry Barnes and he was a sailor this whole group of people is standing in the hallway by the stairs and then the psychic tells a photographer which she had brought along with her hey take a picture he's right over my head at the very moment when she's saying this to the photographer this couple they have a little dog jumps up flattens its ears and runs off to the other side of the room where it has its cage they all feel this icy cold blast of air the psychic turns around and tells Henry hey you need to leave but guess what Henry doesn't want to leave and Henry doesn't leave like happens a lot of times after the psychics visit the activity starts to increase and one night the woman she's at her dressing table she's getting ready for bed her husband's already asleep and then out of the corner of her eye just outside the open bedroom door she sees what looks like a white flowing apparition on the stair banister and it disappears she obviously doesn't call the psychic back but somehow or other she gets connected to Kenny Beeson and he tells her how he solved his haunting problem and they contact Monsignor Jordan who comes over that afternoon goes to the same exorcism ritual and that was the last that anyone has seen or heard of Henry Barnes is he still wandering up and down St. George Street we'll never know but there's a very good possibility that he is the next story is again on St. George Street at a location that originally was built by one of the founding members there in St. Augustine a gentleman by the name of uh, Francisco Pelliser. on that location in St. George Street there was a house named Pelliser de Burgo house and it the house was there until about 1841 and then it was you know demolished or sometimes burnt down it was reconstructed in 1976 but in those intervening years there was a building there on St. George Street that was a combination storefront store and apartment buildings that was owned by the Paff family which is what this story is about some of the dates are mixed up as far as the story is concerned but when you looked at, at what actually happened these were the exact dates it's truly really dated to September of 1928 the horrific hurricane hit Florida cut across the state and there was a large amount of loss of life over 3,000 people but it, it did come in very close to St. Augustine and as the story goes the hurricane is raging along the coast there's debris 
70 mile per hour winds uh, down St. George Street. The streets are flooded, power is out, uh, everything is shuttered up. All the families are indoors. Two days before, there's a nurse. At that time, nurses would make home visits by the name of Maggie Hunter, and she is stopped to check on local history says Mrs. Paff. In actuality, it was Mr. Clement Paff's maternal grandmother, Mary Jane Hernandez. Uh, she was ill and bedridden, and it seems when the nurse comes to visit her that she's in very serious condition. Because of the storm, she decides to stay, and she sends word back to the hospital. It's the evening of the third day, and this hurricane has raged on for two days. The lady's condition is not really improving. So during this time, this nurse goes to the kitchen, warm up some milk for her because this patient can hardly keep down any food. She's elderly. There's only one other person, which is the grandson, Clement, and he's there bent over his ham radio, receiving information about the hurricane. As the nurse steps into the bedroom, she sees kneeling beside the bed, this shadowy form of a nun wearing the habit of the Sisters of St. Joseph. She can't see the nun's face. She's praying the rosary for this poor old woman that's in the bed. The nurse has been in the house for the past three days. She knows that no one's left or entered during all that time. She's very shaken. She runs back to the study to tell the grandson what she's seen. And strangely enough, he's not alarmed. And he tells her, oh, that's just Sister Mary Helen. She always shows up when anything serious happens. And he goes back to his radio. She's quite startled and she goes back to the room. The nun is gone. She finds that the patient is feeling much better. By that afternoon, the weather's improved. The nurse returns to her house. However, three days later, she comes by, check on the patient. The door is answered by the grandson. She inquires after the elderly woman. He's concerned because she says, well, she's been babbling up about a Spanish sentry coming to take her home, except for that she's about the same as she was. So the nurse goes into the house, goes back into the bedroom where this elderly patient's at. As she enters, she freezes because they're standing by the lady's bed is what appears to be a blue-coated 17th century Spanish sentry. She, of course, turns, rushes back down the hall, calling for the grandson. Quickly, they return back to the old woman's room. The sentry's gone. The elderly lady has died. When you look at the records as far as the timing, yes, there was there was no hurricane during 1927. However, there was a very severe storm hurricane, uh, specifically 17th of September 1928. And if you look at the vital statistics, this lady, Mary Jane Hernandez, who was a maternal uh, grandmother to Clement Pfaff, uh, passed away September 19th, 1928. She, at that time, she was about aged 83 or 84. So it seems that even though at the onset it might have looked like a little bit of an urban myth, it apparently sounds like it's a true story of what happened back in the 1920s to uh, a visiting nurse who came by to see a patient. Apparently, they had a family ghost that was seen when something was going to happen with one of the family members. For the last two stories, uh, really they're not stories, they're about places and closing, which I very think are very charming and very interesting is just north of St. Augustine is a place called Villano Beach. And Villano Beach is about 30 minutes south of Jacksonville. As a matter of fact, that's how I found it myself when I was driving up to Jacksonville. This is a beautiful little beachfront area that when I was there maybe 10 years ago and subsequently I've stayed there, it's very quiet even now they've built a Publix and it's becoming a little bit more lively. At one point, Henry Flagler, him and other tycoons that were developing Florida back in the 20s would take tourists out there to the beachfront as a way to entice them to buy land. Subsequently, they had a big hotel built with a casino. However, in 1937, a hurricane came along, wiped it out. You could still go out there. It's a very charming area and there's a marker there. And again, for those of you who are looking to maybe have a paranormal experience, I'm always a believer that you can come across incidents or experiences in the most likely of places, especially places like this where once a hotel stood, which are hot spots for hauntings during the prohibition, the time of the flappers, bootleggers, etc. And you better believe, I'm sure there was some type of bootlegging going around in this area because it sits right on the coast and it was 
blown away overnight because of that hurricane. It's a beautiful area to visit. You'll love it. But if you go to the marker where the casino used to be and hang out there for a little bit, I'm sure you're going to come across a really strange vibe. Now, the second area, maybe you'll have that incidental paranormal experience, is just south of St. Augustine is an area, well, presently at one point there was a Fort Matanzas. And Matanzas in Spanish, Matanzas, is basically an area where a large amount of killing or a massacre has occurred. The story behind that is in 1565, this is before actually the fort had been built. The, the Spanish have already were occupying the fort of San Marco and St. Augustine, Saint, uh, you know, San Agustin, which is how the Spanish called it back then. And further up north, uh, by Jacksonville, there was a French who had a fort. So, of course, this is very close proximity to each other. So, French and the Spanish, of course, they're having their skirmishes because they're trying to basically claim the same territory. There's a ship that comes out of Jacksonville where the French force was at. It was a matter of fact, it was commanded by a man by the name of Jean Ribot, a settlement called Fort Caroline. And the Spanish, of course, claimed that territory. They send out a fleet, and this fleet is caught by this terrible hurricane. The ship gets wrecked, and I guess they were very close to the shore, and the men basically make it, make it to shore just a little bit further south of where the Spanish were. They wade ashore, but remember, they have no food, no water, and something very important. These were Protestants. They were Huguenots. A large portion of them were Huguenots. They, they're found by the Spanish, and they have no weapons. And the Spanish give them a choice. Either you convert to Catholicism, or you die. And 245 of those Frenchmen decided that they would not convert to Catholicism. They were executed, killed as heretics. This was around the time that this is why that bay or that inlet is called Matanza Inlet, Matanza Bay, and then subsequently the Fort Matanzas. Of course, later, uh, the, the Spanish were there for about another 235 years. In about 1569, they make a, a wooden watchtower and a hut just north of the Matanza Inlet. And there they kept like maybe less than 10 soldiers. This is about 14 miles south of St. Augustine. They were doing this little outlet or this little watchtower. They were watching the back door into St. Augustine in case somebody was coming up the coast from the south versus the north. They would be able to alert this stronger, larger military presence in St. Augustine. 1733, move forward, what, 50 years or so. General James Oglethorpe, he's in Georgia in an English colony. Spain is laying claim to that. Their skirmishes and what he does is he uh, runs a blockade into the Matanza River. And remember, back in these times, all these outposts, forts, villages, whatever was there, their subsistence, they, they, they needed things to come in on ships. This was how important. And when you blockaded an inlet or a river, basically you were cutting off whatever depended uh, on that area for it to come in. The point being that despite maybe no documentation, in that area, I'm sure there were other skirmishes and deaths, etc. Now, in 1740, Governor Manuel de Montiano, he's having all these skirmishes, so he wants to replace that wooden post. And from 1740 to 1742, he builds Fort Matanzas, and it's built out of stone. And he builds it on a two-acre island, which has grown over time because of the tides and hurricanes over two miles, on a place known as Rattlesnake Island. This stone structure sits in the middle of nowhere. It's manned by less than 10 soldiers. And what they would do is they would patrol the waterways, the surrounding inlets, and they also live there. And again, the purpose of that fort was a lookout on the back door or the way into St. Augustine. It, they also had cannons there that they could point down the river. And if there was any ships that would come in trying to advance up the river, they could fire on them and of course alert the military and people that lived in St. Augustine. In 1750, they have five cannons from all approaching directions. And this points to, of course, that th there was hostilities, absolute hostilities between the Spaniards and whether it's the French or the English or anybody out there. Then by 1763, the English have taken control of Fort Matanzas and they also use it as a watchtower. Then by 1821, Florida was ceded to the United States, and which includes the fort, but by then it's in ruins. In 1924, this fort is proclaimed a national monument, and then in 1933, it's transferred to the War Department as a national park. 
which is what it is now that you can visit it. The actual Rattlesnake Island, by the way, is you can only gain access to it either by boat or swimming. And I'm not sure if, if the park services have a way to take people out there as far as around it. But from what I understand, it's not really a good idea to go on the island itself. It's marshy. There's rattlesnakes. There's also saltwater crocodiles. But you could probably go around it. I, I, I'm not sure. Now, there's certain people in the area who have claimed seeing paranormal thing. One of the, the people that has worked for many, many years driving the ferry and also local fishermen, they report that they have seen a green light that emerges from the surface of the water and that once it breaks the surface, it turns white and a beautiful face emerges and disappears into thin air. Others report that they've seen the waters turn red, blood red after sunset and that the sands on the bay are also said to have a reddish tint when stepped on. Has it related or connected to those 245 men that were massacred? It's not known. Each Halloween, I believe they do give ghost tours of Matanzas Bay by boat. Definitely a place to check out because even if you don't go on the actual boat tour, uh, it is a national park. And again, I stress, sometimes the places that are not officially haunted, even though the fort itself, which you can't get, gain access to the island, is said to be haunted by the soldiers that used to live there. Uh, again, there's I'm sure there's many incidents of skirmishes, of sudden deaths, of violence, absolutely, that were never documented in the history books, but that if it's not an intelligent haunting, it left some type of imprint on the fabric of that time and place. So again, I hope you like these stories about St. Augustine. Definitely a place worth checking out. I didn't include stories about the better known locations in St. Augustine, like the, the Fort, San Marcos Fort, or the Lighthouse, because those have been covered extensively by a lot of the shows and different authors. So I thought I'd bring forth the ones that are a little bit lesser known, and again, always if you walk around the streets of St. Augustine especially after dark and you're not in the tour you never know when you're going to come across uh, one of those St. Augustinians who just do not lie quietly in their graves.